Hi everyone and welcome to Active Travel Cafe. We are delighted tonight for to welcome Tom Byans, the new CEO of London Cycling Campaign and then followed by Ranty Highwayman with the good, the bad, the ugly, the interesting of infrastructure. Um, but before we get on to that, uh, shall we go through our news? Uh, who has got news for us today. Please pop your hand up or mention something in the chat. Bob, I see your hand. What's your news today, Bob? Uh, two things. I've just seen that uh, Annie Hidalgo in Paris, I know this is abroad, but it could happen here, is um, putting forward a vote for people to vote on whether they want SUVs to play higher parking charges. So that's nice to see. And don't forget the Road Danger Reduction Forum webinar on December the 11th. I'll be sending out publicity shortly. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Bob. Um, I hadn't heard that yet about Anne Hidalgo in Paris, so something to keep an eye on, definitely. Uh, Amy, what would you like to share? Um, hi, I just wanted to mention that the uh, Police and Crime Committee of the London Assembly is hosting an inquiry into a serious injury collision investigation. We think this is the first time this has happened in the country. Uh, the first session is next week. Action Vision Zero is giving evidence, as is um, a few solicitors and break and road piece. And then there'll be a follow-up session in January when the police and TFL are called uh, to be held to account. Um, my colleague, Victoria Lebrecht, set up a small working group, um, and we're really just trying to make sure these are, we're talking when we talk about the serious injury collisions, the ones that don't get the forensic investigators. Um, this is about um, 10 people a day that seriously injured in crashes in London. Over half of those would be people walking and cycling. And we want the focus to be on proving the investigations into those collisions. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. Amy. It would be great to know, um, you know, at the right time, who could come and speak to us um, and, and provide a bit more information. Um, about what's happening there so do let us know if and when we should have that session okay. thank you uh excellent i can see councillor scott arthur and i'm sorry i can't see what city you're from zoom's not showing me but councillor scott what can you share for us i'm from the greatest city in the world uh, edinburgh ah okay <laughs> The uh, so very very quickly. Sorry, I was late. The uh, so on Thursday here in Edinburgh, we should ban pavement parking right across the city on all five thousand two hundred seats streets. Sorry, in the city, uh, there is exemptions though for emergency vehicles and believe it or not, couriers. This is set by the Scottish government. Couriers where there's no alternative, but they still have to leave one point five meters of footpath if they do park on the pavement. But for everyone, you know, so essentially all privately owned cars in the city uh, from January, they won't be able to won't be able to park on the pavement, or they'll be subject to a one hundred pound fine. So, and it's been really positive actually. Obviously, there's some people who have concerns about it, and there's still some things we have to work through. Uh, but by and large, uh, people have been very supportive, and uh, even some of the usual suspects who have been hostile to some of the moves towards more sustainable modes of transport in the city have said they, they said quite openly they support it. So a very positive thing, actually. Brilliant. And hopefully um, emboldens other parts of the United Kingdom to, to catch up. Really Absolutely. exciting. Well done, Edinburgh. Uh, and once again, once that's up and running, would be great to have someone come and, come and present about um, how it's been working. Excellent. Leo, you're up. What's your news? Hi, everyone. Uh, my news is that we are, at possible, working on a school run cruncher, which will let us determine the share of congestion on local roads that is being caused by the school run. And I am looking for some trial participants. That is to say, uh, if you know of a road that is locally um frequently congested because of the private school run traffic in particular and um, that anecdotally you've noticed this please could you get in touch because we need to pick a few locations to run the first uh goes on this so it's like it's using the google maps api and stuff 
it's quite complex, but it looks like it will work. So yeah, if people have some suggestions for some lo for, for some locations, I'd be very grateful. We'll we'll use those as the tests, and Leo, I will be coming back to us... Active Travel Ca Cafe. Yeah, can you tell us who we is? Who who are you representing? Yeah, sorry, <laughs> possible the climate charity possible. So um, yeah, the goal the goal is to have a tool anyone can use to, and it it will take a year to produce data, but it will analyze the school run period uh on that road for a year um and then work out the difference between the times when schools are in or when they're out and of course private schools have different um timings and we suspect they are responsible for a very disproportionate share of the congestion so the idea is this will be a tool for advocates to use to push for school streams um and yeah it looks like it all works so we're now ready to run a few tests um so that's what i'm looking for is some suggestions from people uh, and I'll be back to an active travel cafe with this once we've made a bit more headway. But um, yeah, please do Thanks, let me know if, if people have locations. Thank you. Great. Great. Leo, if you could put some contact details in the chat, that would be great. I think a few people are keen yeah, to get it, in you, including me. <laughs> OK, Graham, what's your news? Yeah, it's um, just a bit of an update on the talk I did last year, about a year ago now, uh, about um, online submission of videos. Um, we had a meeting a week ago with Greater Manchester Police with the, um, the op Operation Considerate team, uh, and it was actually very positive. And um, I think uh, things are actually improving a lot on, the, on the, the way those things are handled. And it actually prompted me to have a look back at uh, last year's data that I presented here and also the, the year since then. Um, and when I look at the data on the submissions that I've made, I think the improvement in there is a, a dramatic improvement in the consistency of decision making. So um, all good news, really. Brilliant. Thank you, Graham. Sylvia, your news. Sylvia, I'm not sure if you're speaking. We can't hear you. No, Sylvia, I'm going to go to Robin and hopefully we'll come back to you and it might be working. Robin, your news, please. I didn't think I had news, but I've, I've thought of some. <laughs> I've thought of some. Um, we have, um, so Oxfordshire missed out on active travel round four, funding round four. Um, I have just learnt officially um, that we are about to make a rebid for part of what we bid for in round four following discussions with active travel england and so um five schemes have been named in a they're going through um cabinet uh, next week um so hopefully we will be successful this time and uh, actually get some money which would be good news fingers crossed and interesting to know that you can renegotiate <laughs> yes i thought people yes. would be interested in that <laughs> yes okay um hopefully though the renegotiation renegotiation is for good schemes not compromised schemes but i'm sure being oxford they'll be fantastic uh, oh woo. <laughs> yes only one of them is in no a couple of them are in oxford but other towns as well they good. Be good schemes great sylvia shall we try again all right can you hear me now Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, sorry about that. So it was just to say that in Brent, so that's a borough outside of, of outer borough of London, we are having a really exciting scheme. Um, I don't know if I can share my screen, but there's uh, wonderful pictures from TfL because TfL is involved in that scheme and it will give us a fully protected crossing over the North Circular, which is a, a really horrible road that is a, a very big severance for everyone uh, in Northwest. I mean, it goes all around London for everyone. So we are very excited and the plans and the design looks really, really good. So if anyone's um, <laughs> using that street, please, I'm going to drop the link in the chat. But do have, have a look and do support the proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, Wilf, some news from you. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Just just to say that um, there was a, a National Trust resolution at the AGM to support better access to um, NT properties for cycling and walking. And it was passed 80 percent majority and and it was supported by the board, which is an even better indication they're actually going to do something. So uh, 
great news and david bennett put put that resolution forward and uh, failed to get it even um onto the agenda last year because you have to get 50 people and this year it's gone through so fantastic news brilliant and i believe my my colleague was telling me that this was the a record breaking motion in terms of the number of responses they'd never had that many responses to a motion before right. um so that certainly says something. it was well over a hundred thousand that that responded i believe um so hopefully well on the agenda for the national trusts now um yes which i i, I would appreciate seeing as i had to walk through the mud to get to uh the last national property trust property i visited <laughs> Okay, Don, you are going to be our lucky last sharer of news before we move on to our guest speaker. What's your news, Don? Oh, thank you. This Liverpoolian went to Manchester Day and enjoyed being enlightened by uh, a number of speakers, courtesy of one of the Landor presentations. So for those that didn't make it, um, hard luck. But it was very good. We heard from uh, our own Brian Deegan uh, and many others. And uh, some of the cheering was done excellently second in command if i might say claire that's that's my news from merseyside brilliant thanks don and of course claire a brilliant chair uh <laughs> okay <laughs> if we do say so ourselves here at active travel cafe right thank you everybody for all of your news and mostly positive i believe which is fantastic as well um shall we now head over to our guest speaker so this evening we are hearing from tom fines who is the new ceo of the london cycling campaign and tom is going to talk to us about the next steps for active travel campaigning in london so i'll just say tom is is new to the post so we're here today to to get to know tom and to understand his ambition for london cycling campaign um but i would just say uh, having having been the new ceo of a cycling campaign in the past um he might not know all the details about various bollard placements and so on so <laughs> let's let's remember we're talking about the big picture here tom anyway uh welcome very much to the world of cycling campaigning and um i shall hand over to you and while i get the slides up perhaps you can tell us a bit more about yourself and your background great yeah thank, thanks thanks um hi everybody um this suddenly feels like quite a huge meeting 92 people it's uh it's an amazing opportunity for me. So thanks for having me, first of all. Um, just by way of quick introduction, I'm I'm definitely very new to active travel and cycling in a campaigning perspective. Um, I mean, I've been a I've been a cyclist in London and a member of LCC for about 15 years. Um, so I know a few of the issues, but not in the kind of level of policy detail that you guys are in. So I mean, I'm aware of the audience. I mean, but it's great for me actually. Uh, timing wise this because I'm very much in a kind of learning learning mode at the moment and listening and trying to understand both the sector and and a lot about cycling and then a lot about London and a lot about the policy stuff um so it's really nice for me to be able to sort of hear oh, such a range of experience I guess there must be hundreds of years of experience in the room on active travel and cycling uh, as well within that so um yeah I'm looking forward to some of the some of the feedback um just really quickly, uh, my background is basically in campaigning and policy. I've worked in national organisations uh, up until now. So I worked for Amnesty International for about 20 years, uh, doing a lot of human rights campaigning. And then I worked for the countryside charity, CPRE, uh, for seven years uh, on all things to do with the countryside and policy and campaigning around that. So I've only ever really worked in membership and volunteer organisations. So I'm very familiar with kind of, you know, that kind of model of delivery and campaigning but obviously the issues in you so um anyway shall i get stuck in because i've got a little bit to cover and roxanne is very helpfully going to help me do the slides because i had a bit of an it glitch earlier on um before i dive in i'm going to make one, one there's one big assumption at the heart of what i'm saying which kind of will be pretty obvious uh to you all but i'm going to just sort of say it anyway and it's a it's it's a sort of an assumption that could be definitely contested, and we could probably have a have another a whole meeting just on this assumption. Um, but I'm kind of assuming that in London, at least, the cycling debate and argument is won in terms of the political support that it enjoys. So we've seen successive mayors of different colours kind of basically put cycling 
uh, you know, as a priority in different ways. And we've got a TFL, uh, the body responsible, kind of delivering a cycling action plan that is, you could, some of it, you could almost write um, as a charity, you know, some of the language it uses around what it wants to do in terms of diversity, in terms of scale of ambition for cycling, et cetera. So there's quite a lot of support. Um, so when I look at the sort of political sort of uh, context that we're working in, I think the genie is a bit out of the bottle on this. So it's about, I think, uh, it's more about who's not cycling and who needs to cycle more rather than whether we've won the debate on whether cycling is a good thing or not and whether it should be being rolled out as a, as a, as a kind of principle. Now, there is some backlash at the moment that we're all seeing around the country, and there's some of that in London. Um, but I, I'm sort of politically saying I think that will die down a bit. I think it's something we need to pay attention to, but I don't think we need to focus on re-winning some of the arguments necessarily at this stage. Okay, so that's my kind of starting big assumption. Um, Roxanne, could I have the first slide, please? Okay, so I'm starting with a massive caveat. Um, this is some stuff that I think we might do more of in the future. That's the biggest caveat probably I could write. So this is because I'm eight weeks in and I'm learning. So I'm putting some stuff out there that I'm sort of testing out really. Uh, not least because I've got, I think I've got about three of my trustees on the call as well, uh, which is always nice. Uh, hi everyone. Um, but I'm also kind of in a process, a strategy process, which has only just begun really. So. These are just a few thoughts to sort of have a conversation about, really. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so very briefly, for anyone that doesn't know about the kind of big picture in London, these are mainly stats from uh, Transport for London. Um, so we've seen a huge rise in cycling. 27% of Londoners in 2021 cycled in some way, and 20% of um, non-cyclists are considering, considering, you know, they're near, near to market as... CFL call them around uh, thinking of cycling. Um, line bike users, that's the, that's the higher scheme, the shared scheme, um, e-bikes are massively grown. And since these figures, actually 1.25 million riders in London, that was between 2019 and 2023. And it's just literally, if you're cycling every day, at the moment, there are, you're outnumbered by line bikers all the time. So, you know, participation rates, this is all different types of cycling and wheeling. But participation in London is, is at all-time high levels. Um, but also, um, I'm really aware there's about three, at least three different Londons. I mean, there's obviously 30, 31 boroughs, some of which are kind of got people here tonight. Um, but there's a, there's a whole different, whichever London you talk about is different for cycling provision. And that's quite a challenge for us as an organisation because we've got to try and address the whole of London, but recognise this not one size fits all. So there's lots of different challenges in inner boroughs, in outer boroughs, in, in between areas. And so it's a bit of a postcode lottery, which is where I'm driving the kind of, it depends who, where you are and who you are as to whether you're cycling in safety or relative safety or not. Okay, next slide, please, Roxanne. Okay, so yeah, building on the assumption I mentioned earlier, you know, what we're, what we're basically saying at the moment, and this is going to build into the mayoral campaign um, that we'll be running, it's basically saying London loves cycling already, it's going mainstream, it's unstoppable, it's common sense, and you'd be a fool not to support it. So we're deliberately trying to sort of ignore the culture war backdrop, really, and say, you know, if you want to have that conversation, that's very backward looking, are you really going to start, re you know, rewinding on um, speed limits on school streets, the kind of action that is just common sense to everybody. Um, so we're kind of saying it's going mainstream in, in the sort of pres presumptions then. So what will that look like from, a, from an LCC point of view? I think there'll be a bit less policy focus and a bit more hearts and minds. So we've got a kind of summit, a campaigner summit at the weekend that's got a, you know nearly 200 people signed up. A lot of the focus of that discussion and workshops are going to be about how you change, change hearts and minds, how you do kind of more emotive campaigning rather than what's the policy detail of the latest, you know, uh, junction design or, or, or lorry, lorry standard or something like that. Um, it's going to be, and this is, this is in London as well, generally, in terms of the type of cycling that we need to support. It's probably going to be a bit less about commuting 
into London and different areas and more about communities and cross community cycling in, in the outer boroughs particularly. So this is looking at, you know, more leisure, um, more educate, you know, cycling for education for leisure needs rather than necessarily going in and out of work into inner London. And as a result of that, it is going to be a bit about less, I put this down as white, white male cyclists, so cyclists like me. <laughs> it's going to be less about me in the future. It's going to be more about the, the, the underrepresented groups in London who are not cycling, but are definitely as much as others, but are thinking about it. And I've listed those there, and they're kind of the, the underrepresented groups. So women, um, Black and Asian, and minority ethnic groups, older, younger, disabled, and lower income groups. So it's going to, our focus is going to be a lot more on what are the barriers to them cycling more and what can we do about it as a charity. Okay, next slide, please. So whilst that's the case, um, I just wanted to mention about safety. I think there was a discussion last week around our dangerous junctions work and some of our messaging on that. Um, but what what it will be about, and this is obviously you all know this more than I do, but you know the key barrier across all groups um, to cycling, the most common barrier is around road safety and danger, and so you know we will be addressing that centrally in our core strategy around making it safer for everyone um, in whatever whatever means we need to. A lot of that will be about cycle lanes and infrastructure, obviously. Um, because without that, we're not going to see the behavior change we need. But so safety will be key. Um, and as I say, some of the stats there around, uh, you know, that cuts across all groups uh, as an issue and a barrier. And even with line bike users, who I'm a bit obsessed about at the moment, because there's so many of them, to be honest, uh, in London, um, they are wanting, in a survey they've done, they, you know, 33% of them want to see more bike lanes. And that's where we can really start to work to work together as a cycling community that's you know getting much more broader and mainstream and more diverse around the kind of things that we all need to benefit from um next slide please max i'm nearly finished i think um so just a quick sort of what will it look like in terms of the mayoral campaign that we've got coming up this is where we're going to kind of test this out um this kind of an approach um so we're basically saying cycling is going mainstreaming, but it needs your support, as into the mayoral candidates. It needs your support to go further. Um, so, you know, lots of messaging around taking cycling forwards and no, 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 no backpedaling, no, no backlash, no delays. We need to keep the momentum. Uh, that will be asks around more money, more cycle lanes, and more outreach work, more work with communities who are not cycling now as ask areas. Um, what that's basically then showing is, you know, we're going to showcase how many people are cycling in London, what, what cycling looks like in all its diverse and amazing and joyous ways, um, and showcase that kind of, you know, community that we are, that are cycling every day. And really sort of then saying this represents about 40%, between 40 and 50% of Londoners, and ignore that at your peril without actually saying vote for, you know, we're not, we won't get into the electoral politics, but... We're basically saying you have a huge constituency there that are supportive of cycling. They're either doing it or thinking about doing it. And that is something that you need to take really seriously and support. And kind of it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So that's a kind of very broad approach um, to the mayoral. And then I think last last slide, what's in the, oh yeah, second to last. So what does it look like? So there will be kind of, you know, hard edged policy asks, but a lot of it will be more about what, what everyday cycling looks like. So lots of really positively framed messaging around user generated content, opinion polls around why people love cycling in London and what they, why they do it and what they, what they would like to see more of. Petitions and digital actions, joint, joint statements, joint, joint things with the um, partners in London around cycling and all the different groups that, currently make up our really diverse community, uh, all kind of saying, you know, London loves cycling and these are the kind of mayoral asks that we want to support and really presenting those. So it'd be a lot about engagement and participation. Um, you know, the mayor already knows that there are 25% of Londoners cycling in London. 
So the need to sort of show deep and wide political support for that isn't as apparent to me as as it might be. So um, you know, we need to show what's next and what the next steps are for for an ambitious mayor with vision. So we're kind of taking lots of lots for granted to some degree, but I think that's a safe bet at the moment. Uh, and I think that is it. I'm seeing the chat going absolutely mad, but I haven't looked at any of it yet. So I'm going to rely on colleagues to maybe pull things out. Um, but yeah, so I suppose really feedback, what are the opportunities and threats? Um, I'm sure you've seen all this before many times. Um, there's nothing new in this, but I'm really interested in kind of any thoughts, really. And if you were giving me advice, um, I'm all ears and uh, thanks for listening. Thank you, Tom. And don't worry about the chat. We'll take care of that for you. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> However, you, right. you, you do realise you, you've you've asked about um, advice and, and you, you may get more than you ever knew was possible. Um, <laughs> excellent. All right. I'm just fixing up my screen so I can help with the questions. And uh, Chair's prerogative, I'm going to jump in with a question of, of mine, if that's all right. Um, sure. Tom, I'm, I'm intrigued about how the this strategic direction that you're developing and particularly heading into the mayoral campaign, how are you going to be collaborating with the various borough groups of, of LCC um, to develop that and implement this strategy? Yeah, um, I mean, it's kind of starting a bit with the, we've got this summit at the weekend, so we've got lots of lots of our borough groups coming to that for the campaigners summit and i'm going to kind of road test this a little bit um and sort of talk about it there and um, but broader than that really i mean i mean obviously I'll, I'll, it's an amazing thing that we've got groups in every borough so we're going to be talking to the campaigns forum we've got various mechanisms that we use to engage with our groups and really hopefully get them fired up around um, you know, the kind of user generated content and all the experience that they've got of cycling in their boroughs to really showcase London in its in its entirety. And, you know, that that so they'll be central really to the success um, of it, really, as well as some of the obviously the political lobbying that we will also do um, that's more core audience based, um, if that makes sense. So, yeah, I. I I hope it's the kind of positive. I tend to find that positive messaging and positive solutions-based campaigning tends to tends to be, you know, welcomed um, as long as we're looking after the the day job on some of the nitty gritty behind the scenes and the inside track lobbying that we do very very effectively at LCC. Thank you, Tom. Okay, here are is the first of our many questions. Uh, Tom, what do you think will happen with progress if Susan Hall is elected in May? Maybe you could tell us who Susan Hall is and yeah. what do you think will happen. So Susan Hall is the Conservative mayoral candidate as, as it stands at the moment. Um, she has a track record. You might have heard of her in the ULES context around very strong opposition to the ULES um, road charging um, scheme for air pollution. Uh, she's generally quite anti, well, she's she's on, on the record as being pretty anti-cycling, uh, or at least certainly, you know, uh, not wanting to get anything in the way of, of car use. Um, so she represents a real, real challenge um, if, if she's a credible candidate. And of, in the outer boroughs of London, certainly she probably would enjoy a lot more support. That's where some of the ULES, uh, anti-ULES sentiment in particular was was coming from so um i think i mean obviously we don't play the party politics stuff but a little taste of what we've got to come probably we did a, the dangerous junctions report last week that highlighted sort of the 10 most dangerous junctions in london and uh within 24 hours there's a big um article in the daily mail about how sadiq khan had put in the the, the current london mayor had put in the killer killer cycling lane and, and how unpopular it was, and it had been weaponized, um, our work there, by the Daily Mail and Susan Hall then attacking, you know, um, Sadiq's record on cycling, which is actually a pretty good one. So he can look after himself, he can defend himself. That's not what we're there for, but it is a pretty good one. Um, and actually Boris Johnson's boss as well before that. So um, of any, whatever the party, we'll, we'll address the policy and we'll call for them all, including Susan Hall, to support cycling through the sort of general manifesto asks that we'll have. 
Um, and I think we'll get into some interesting debates if it goes that way around LTNs and, um, and you know, some of the measures that we think work, but conservative councils generally don't tend to adopt. And, and certainly conservative mayoral candidates tend, will probably be trying to weaponize in some way. Thanks, Tom. Um, okay, well, and I think you'll have your big election. We've got elections coming up around the country. Um, so uh, with the message cycling has gone mainstream for London, what do you think we can take from that for the rest of the country in terms of making it mainstream everywhere else where we don't have 27% um, of people cycling, for example? Yeah, it's, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I'm looking forward to meeting, uh, visiting some of the other cities because I think it's really important to, for me to learn from, from there and what, what's working and what isn't. I mean, I guess what I would hope that, I think, as I say, it's the, it's the sort of positive framing, really. I think we're going to be showing a city that is cycling more and more and the types of people that are cycling are getting more and more diverse and you you know we'll be using lots of different arguments around the, the benefits of cycling but you know looking at um the low cost nature the health benefits and really they'll come through in some of the kind of stories that i think we'll be telling when you can look across london so i hope that if anything is exported it's kind of that you can run a a very solutions-based campaign in a highly politically charged environment and still win the win the arguments and broaden your constituencies. Because I think I think you know um you don't need, I mean I think you'll be seeing this in, in some of the places where you're already getting infrastructure, you don't need high percentages of, of the population to really, really support you, but you do need a kind of common sense argument that says, is you know, is cycling a good thing? yes, all these benefits, why wouldn't you be thinking of doing this in a, in a climate emergency, in a health emergency, in a congestion and air pollution emergency context? So I hope the positive messaging rings true and, and kind of could, could work elsewhere. And I'm sure there'll be many people here today who would be very happy to invite you to visit their, their cities and towns. Uh, so Thanks. I can extend an invitation to Cambridge right off the bat. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. When, when you're ready, I'm sure you're you're not busy at all. Well, uh, <laughs> I've got to admit, I'm, I've got a got a true confession. I'm going to Oxford on the seventh of December, so I'm going there, and uh, hopefully to oh, Manchester as well if I get an invite. <laughs> but I'll be spreading spreading my learning everywhere. Hopefully, nothing to do with me, Roxanne. <laughs> all fine. No, Oxford and Cambridge are good friends. Okay, <laughs> uh, Tom. Uh, down to a, a nice um, detail for you. Can LCC do anything to engage delivery companies to introduce standards for food delivery and other riders, e.g. a code of conduct that means they support their riders more and so riders stick to the rules of the road? And if I might add, riders use road legal <laughs> um, bicycles yeah. as well. Um, I'm sure this is a huge issue in, in London. What's LCC's take on this? Yeah, it's a really, I'm just getting up to speed on a lot of the kind of hot topics and the policy stuff. I mean, I, I, I read an article yesterday about, um, you know, illegal e-bikes being driven at 80 miles an hour by some of the young kids and dangerous chases and shearing, et cetera. I mean, I think there's a, I think there is a genuine challenge, actually. I think, you know, when you look at micro mobility and what it's certainly the shared use stuff in London, it, it's transforming the political and social and environmental landscape in terms of cycling. So I think we have to be really clear and positive where we can be about what that's enabling people to do who don't normally cycle. But if we're talking about specific groups like um, delivery, delivery riders and, you know, um, who are using the infrastructure along with everyone else uh, and benefiting from that, I think there's been a code of conduct just been agreed or announced or something that, that with some of them in London. And I think, you know, obviously we'd be supportive of that. Um, but. I also kind of want to just put down a kind of, I think one thing I've learned in my campaigning and policy career so far is you really have to focus to have success. So I don't know whether we'll be addressing that kind of issue in the strategy as much as, as, as other areas where it's more about getting equitable cycling rates across the whole of London. So we'll have to make difficult choices about what we prioritize. It's the same with e-cargo and, and areas like that where there are other organizations potentially covering things i think 
we might try and um, be quite light touch on some of that stuff. Thanks, Tom. Um, yep, I can agree. That's a really tricky space to navigate. Um, another tricky space is, is when we're talking about safety, because clearly we want to highlight where things aren't safe, but also we don't want to scare people off cycling. Mm. So, um, you know, do you have a strategy about how you can get those safety improvements without scaring potential cyclists off? Yeah, it's really hard, this one. I mean, obviously, I am so new, but there's always there's always really inherent contradictions and paradoxes that you have in messaging. And I think the safety message, given it's the main barrier, is, a, is obviously um, a really big one. I had this actually, my daughter, I wrote a column on this for them for the next magazine. Um, my daughter wanted to start cycling to work at sort of seven in the morning a few weeks ago. And she's not really cycled in London. And I was immediately quite worried about that. And then also really supportive at the same time um, for all the reasons you, you can imagine. Um, so it's, you know, we've had quite a few fatalities in London recently and, and in my, and in the area that I live in. And it's really brought home the reality that, you know, it is getting safer, but it's not safe enough. And I think we need, we can't hold back on messaging sometimes that, you know, we're not going to get the kind of political change and political will strong enough if we're not saying that sometimes it's a dangerous thing uh, and these things need improving. I just don't, I don't think we can accept that, you know, the London mayor's vision for, for zero vision is going to include, you know, 100 more cyclists dying before the infrastructure is in place and, and, the, and the policies are in place. So we need to bring it all forward. And that's stating the obvious. So I think we can't duck sometimes that we're going to we're going to need to talk about danger. But I think it can't. It's obviously nowhere near the only thing you talk about. And it should always be balanced and in a context. And I think the recent dangerous junctions work does highlight a quite horrific situation in some parts of London. And we do need to do that. Um, but at the same time, you know, you see the, the approach we'll be taking in the mayoral campaign. It will be it will be asking for cycle lanes and more funding to make it safer. But it will be talking about the, the joy and the kind of widespread nature of cycling in London now and that that needs to continue. So I think we have to be able to do both. I think I'm, I'm learning, you know, I'll, I'll obviously be learning about the nuances of how we do that well and how we do it better. But, um, you know, I think I think the problem I've got with it a bit in my mind is it's not a linear, change is never a linear process. So we can't just stop talking about safety because, you know, it, it's gonna have to go backwards to go forwards again. And sometimes that means having debates that might scare people a bit and then, you know, move forward again over that and with the increased infrastructure and safety that that's going to bring in the long term, if that makes sense. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, okay, I'm just uh, skipping through here. Well, right. How are you addressing problems needing greater law enforcement? So another element of, of safety. Um, are you engaging with the Met Police? Um, and I'll just add to that as well. Um, I just attended the all party parliamentary group for walking and cycling yesterday where the Met were talking about their actions on cycle theft as well. So, um, mm -hmm. it'd be, you know, they're clearly ramping up their efforts there. So enforcement and dealing with cycle theft um, and working mm -hmm. with the police. Uh, in, in the eight weeks you've been in the post, what can you tell us about what you'll be doing there? Well, the good news is there's, there's some of you will know um, him. There's another Tom at LCC called Tom Bogdanovitz, who is an absolute um, expert on enforcement and well he's an expert on many things to do with cycling um and uh, he does a lot of work with the met uh on bike theft and enforcement and speed and um it's quite inside track lobbying so it's we're on advisory groups it's that type of work um so it's quite under the radar but it's vital uh and i think that's the place for that kind of work generally um it's quite technical um you know some of it can be quite sensitive so I think we're getting progress certainly with lorries and some of the enforcement that's now coming through on lorry danger we've seen what can be done through that kind of method um but bike theft is a really interesting one because I think it's the third biggest bar barrier in London to cycling across all groups but potentially low income groups even more so so I think you know we need to we need to look at that and see how we can work with the Met and certainly obviously uh 
you know getting your bike back in London is virtually not not going to happen if it gets stolen and that's just not acceptable but we've got to think about ways of um, improving the record of the Met and the approach we've also just just to flag also um we're doing some work on women's experience of cycling in London at the moment and there's different elements of enforcement and uh, there's women suffering which may not be news but it's still terrible uh, news that they're suffering discrimination and uh, um harassment and, and we're looking at that and looking at some of the asks in that in the new year around the Met and what what they can do to improve both routes and also the sort of physical safety of women. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, Tom, I'm going to bring us to the last question. Um and I'm I'm sort of going to wrap a few questions into one. If if, if <laughs> I can enormous question. Yes. Yeah, so right, just okay. just and you need to give us a really quick answer. No, no, no. You do elaborate. <laughs> I'll do my best. So um, you did mention that the, the case for cycling in London has been won. However, I would say that maybe the case for traffic reduction and particularly through traffic reduction, um, maybe not quite so won. Um, so mm. and here is me blending together the questions. So uh, LCC campaigning, um, continuing to make demands for through traffic free roads or um, we call it um, filtered permeability, um, or um, you know, reduction in car dependency uh, and that dominance of the car. So how is LCC going to, to deal with cars, basically? Yeah, and the great car question. I thought I might get away with it. Um, so, I mean, I yeah. It, I mean, I mean, the the honest answer is we we definitely address that and will address that. And our policy asks of the mayor will, you know, I mean, the mayor's the mayor's kind of transport strategy is, encompasses all modes of travel, obviously, and including cycling. So, um, you know, we're not going to get to vision zero in deaths in cycling and pedestrians if we're not reducing car use, uh, full stop. So, it's it's totally the backdrop um that for all our work i mean i suppose i don't know i mean some ltns and some of the work there uh we need to kind of keep pushing at a borough level i think we're gonna i think the honest answer though is a lot of this is going to go to a borough level in terms of the next few years in terms of winning some of the changes that we need to win you've seen with you les what can happen if it's a pan london discussion uh and if it gets politicized so you know, Sadiq Khan has started to kind of pull back a bit from road charging, uh, having been supportive and or technically supportive in the past. In the, and it is in the transport strategy. So I think we're going to have to choose our choose our moments for those debates. And certainly the, the, the air pollution debate and some of the coalitions that work on that will be taking forward those arguments. And, and we're not going to duck it, that, don't get me wrong. But um, I suppose we're going to... We're going to try and be as pro cycling and proactive travel as much as possible, and you know, anti car only gets you so far you know, in terms of of a messaging um, challenge. You know, if you're trying to sway people, it's a tactical thing, I guess. But we won't duck, we won't duck it when it when it you know when it matters. I don't think. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it wasn't very concise. Sorry. <laughs> it's difficult to to be concise. It's a a challenging one. Although, of course, I think. Uh, a few people would pop up here and say it's not anti-car it will make driving better if we can re reduce congestion and and so on as well it so it's, um, the messaging is is hard and and owning the message is hard anyway whatever you say others may change your yeah. message for you. yeah absolutely That's very yeah. yeah yeah brilliant tom well um i think you've got a taste of the challenges we we <laughs> see lcc and i think that you know for all the all of us working around the country you know where where LCC leads. You know the rest of the country can follow. So so you're doing it for all of us. Uh, again, no pressure. But um, welcome to the role. Welcome to the world of cycling campaigning. And thank you so so much for for coming and speaking with us today. And I hope we can have you back um, in a few months' time and 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 see how things are going. Yeah. Listen. Thanks so much for the opportunity. And yeah, I look forward to meeting some of you, as many of you as I can over the next couple of years. So. Um, yeah, thanks. That was, uh, yeah, very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And clearly uh, of great interest to us. We've got such a great um, attendance today, over 90 people, all keen to find out more about who Tom is. 
<laughs> Wonderful. Tom, you're very welcome to, to stick around. And by all means, if you want to try and go through the chat, we didn't get through all the questions. Um, but also feel free to, to leave if it's if it, if you're done. No, I'll, I'll stay. Well, thank You'll you. stay. Well, then you will get to enjoy the wonderful delight that is Ranty Highwayman, also known as Mark Philpot, with the good, the bad, and the interesting. Mark, are you here and ready to go? I'm here in voice, but my camera's failed. So um, hopefully my voice is working. Your voice is working? That's good enough. Green share will work. And hopefully the screen share is working. Yes, it is. Excellent. Well, Mark, I shall hand over to you. Um, and what are you talking about today? Well, first of all, just say thank you to Tom, because as an outer Londoner, um, we, we have felt a bit left out. So looking forward to Saturday, which I'll be talking at as well, trying to unpick out of London with uh, my colleague from Barnet. So, yeah, looking forward to that. So uh, for this session, I am going to be looking at terrible and tr terrific transitions. Oops, and I went too far there. Um, so it's, it's some of the basic stuff that I'm always going on about, but um, lot, lots about cycling here, a little bit about wheeling and walking. Um, but just start ourselves off with a nice shot from Glasgow showing us mixing signalised crossings and zebra crossings, which the Department for Transport really don't like. So it's great that people are doing it, just ignoring them. But that aside, the, the point of this particular slide and, and the rest of them as we go through is to say, from a, certainly from a cycling point of view, if you're moving from cycle tracks to carriageways and, and vice versa, we don't want to be seeing curbs laid across the line of travel or along the line of travel. So let's look at a couple of things first. Um, Curbs can grab wheels. I don't think that's a surprise to those of us who've managed to have our wheels grabbed by curbs. Even a very, very, very slight upstand is enough to grab um, any kind of wheel, really. Um, not unlike tram lines. So if you're trying to mount a curb like this in the photo and you're going across at a very shallow angle, that's going to grab your wheels and potentially throw you off. So curbs can be very, very dangerous. Um, this is Barking Riverside down here in London, where it's a complete mess, this particular junction. But the point to pick out here is, from a cycling point of view, we're crossing various curb lines, depending what we're doing. So there is a risk here as we turn off the cycle track on, onto a road to go into a side road, we might be catching ourselves on these curbs. So, yeah, we don't like to see that. We like to see continuous um, asphalt for cycle tracks. Um, one here from Havering. Just to show, um, I don't know, we used to do stuff in Havering, um, not very well. Um, here really to show the upstand there probably isn't so bad. Certainly coming off, it's not a particular issue. But on the left there, if you're seeing the red, you're seeing the markings, it's a bit murky. And that's where you kind of join. Again, something to throw you, throw you off, it's uh, quite dangerous. Um, for Ruth especially, um, and I, I did steal Human Travel's photo here from C9 in Chiswick. Um, what we have in this particular location is curbs running across the cycle track again at a junction. Um, kind of fine while the curbs are nice and flush. They do have a tendency to fail in that position, whether a, a lorry catches it or something. They, they do tend to pop out, and as they stick out the ground, that becomes another um, hazard. Just a little aside here, um, what this is also doing is sending out lots of different messages. So the messages we're seeing here is, well, the cycle track's got priority, hasn't it? Because as a cyclist, that's what you're seeing. As a driver, notwithstanding um, the giveaway markings here for people coming out, it's hinting at us with the yellow lines. It's a bit of a speed hump that drivers are, useful, uh, are used to going over in London, but it kind of says, well, that's, that's maybe driver priority. So we, we we, we're fudging the issue here a little bit. Personally, I want to see the cycle tracks running across. I want to see the footways running across. Uh, continuous treatments. Yeah, tactile paving, absolutely fine there. Um, if you are trying to rejoin this carriageway, you have to turn your head all the way around to see behind you. Um, and if you were actually joining this with a drop curb uh, somewhere else, um, that's not the problem. But as a tricycle user, once you have this slope running across your line of travel, that's something that could throw you off. So these these cambers are a problem for three or more wheels. Uh, so we don't really want to be seeing those. Um, we can have forgiving curbs. So here's, here's an example. 
that particular slope is about 20 degrees, I think. Um, probably up to 30 degrees, it's okay. Any more than 30 degrees, you have to be even more careful. But that particular one, and up to 30 degrees, with care, you can bounce up and, do, and, and down those all day. And if you're a disabled cyclist or you've got a cargo bike that you don't particularly want to try and push because it's heavy, you can very carefully leave the cycle track or join the cycle track here. So curbs can be forgiving from that point of view. And if you have very small wheels, uh, such as a buggy, uh, when we talk about crossings, the curbs need to be flush. Probably a debate about tactile paving, but that's for another day. Um, but of course, where we're going with continuous treatments, we don't need curbs. Um, people tell me continuous treatments are new. They're not. This one's Walton on the Nays out in Essex, at least 20 years old, if not more. Um, they don't don't have entrance curbs as we know them now, but it's um, priority of pedestrians by design. So it's design priority. Uh, the designer there put the tactiles in, which I think is a good, a good idea. And we know it's a low traffic side road because uh, there's a nipper just walking around quite happy and safe. Um, if we head up to Birmingham, yes, we don't need curbs. So the carriageway conditions, not great here, but there's no curbs across the cycle track. But that's not to fail. So it's asphalt to asphalt. That's what we like to see. Um, let's go across to Cambridge for Cambridge Claxon. Um, no curbs across the cycleway there. Nice and smooth, nice and flush. Uh, and in fact, that cycle track has been laid into the road and round in one hit. So there's not even a seam. Uh, where the two join so yes so this is this is a, a terrific transition and if we just go up the road from here um so, so previously that was the fender road roundabout this is the histon road cyclops um in the northern city uh, again asphalt to asphalt no curbs in a way really nice and smooth just what we want to see but of course as ever none of this is new so this is bracknell a shared path going across a side road with uh, walking and cycling priority. Again, old fangled if you like, but the important th thing here is from a cycling point of view, um, we've got no curbs to, to rattle over. I guess these days, I, I think my view is we probably want tactile paving. We probably don't have shared paths quite like this, but um, you know, it's good, does the job, no problem at all there. Here's another really old example. I think this is near uh, Frinton on Sea in Essex. This is actually the end of a road, just a cul-de-sac turns into a cycle track. It's a bit old. It's a bit tired. There's cracks in the road here. But in theory, we've got that transition right there. Um, again, none of this stuff is new. So let's round up with a couple more slides. Um, let's criticise the Dutch for a change because we always think they're brilliant. Um, we have curbs running across the line of travel here. Um, not particularly even, so even the Dutch don't get it right. Uh, but they usually do. So here we go again, another um, a Dutch Cyclops, if, if we can annoy our Dutch colleagues. Um, there we go, asphalt to asphalt, nice and smooth, no problem at all. And it's seamless uh, most of the time. So this is um, a little service road in Rotterdam where drivers have to, let's get this right, we're on the correct side of the road, so drivers are turning left to rejoin the main road there. Um, and from that point onwards, um, you can just see where the cycle uh, sign is. From that sign, sign onwards is a cycle track. So not only do we have a seamless um, asphalt to asphalt uh, sort of service road to cycle track with seamless provision for cycling, um, and it's the drivers have to get out of there and go somewhere else. This actually feeds uh, another uh, protected junction. Uh, they're just making use of the cycleway um, and, and the service road working together. And you don't notice it. This this type of seamless uh, transition is everywhere in the Netherlands. Uh, this is oh, I can't remember where this one is. I think it might have been Leiden. Um, this is an interesting street with cycle lanes rather than tracks. But at the point of conflict on this really weird left hand bend here, a couple of bus stops. Uh, because of all the conflicts going on there, cycling is taken around the back. Um, again, completely seamless transitions we don't notice it and i shall end with this one it's absolutely everywhere here's a really really simple cross this is just to the south of um, amsterdam actually next to a retail park um, with a direct cycle track into the mcdonald's believe it or not but again even though we have the cycle traffic uh, and the pedestrians giving way um, from the cycling point of view it's asphalt to asphalt completely smooth uh, and a great transition 
And that's me for this session. I shall stop sharing. Thank you, Mark. Um, excellent. Uh, has anyone got questions for Mark? Um, I'll say we've got some comments, um, which is, you don't half forget get around, do you? Uh, did you visit all those places and take all those photos yourself, or have you had contributions from others? Apart from when I, sh I stole from Human Travel in Chiswick, um, they're all mine. I did actually find mine one after I put the slides together. So, yes, I've been to all of those places and geeked out at the lack of curbs. Brilliant. Nothing like a, a cycling infrastructure tour. <laughs> I imagine all of our holidays are like that. Um, now we shall add smooth transitions to our itineraries. Uh, okay. Any questions for for Mark? Or oh, I think we all believe you and um, don't need to ask any questions. So you've given us all the information we need. Brilliant. Okay. Uh -huh. There we go. Oh, here we go. We've got a question. All right. <laughs> um, Rachel would like to know, do you want a, oh no, sorry. That's about who our speakers are. So no, Mark, you are off the hook and it sounds like we're going to have an early night. So if I might um, do some closing remarks, firstly, we shall thank Tom and Mark for being our wonderful speakers this evening. Thank you very much. Um, Tom, please add terrific transitions to your campaigning strategies. <laughs> uh, next week, we have got another fantastic speaker, as always. Uh, next week is Isabel Clement of Wheels for Wellbeing. Um, and Isabel is going to discuss how the lived experience of disabled cyclists is influencing general thinking around walking, wheeling and cycling. And Isabel has been a fantastic influencer in making sure we talk about walking, cycling and wheeling. So it will be great to learn more about how she has done that and how we can help. Um, and so we are also nearing our run, nearing the end of the year and our current run of speakers. So our last session is going to be on the 12th of December. Um, and do let us know if you've got ideas for speakers in the new year so that we can get our schedule nice and full for you all. But we have a pretty good track record after all this time of, of keeping good speakers coming for you all. Uh, I think that's it. Time to wind up. So thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful, if not dark, evening. And we shall see you next week with Isabel Clements. Bye. <laughs>